that's what we do. We show the screen, then it works. <laughs> hey everybody, the tech person is Gary. I'm just the talent. <laughs> okay, so the tech person will now welcome you to uh, tonight's uh, tonight's webinar, which is audiobook techniques and how to land work. I'm Gary McFadden, the editor of the VoiceOver Insider and the behind-the-scenes tech person for the VoiceOvers.com webinar series. From the sound of my voice tonight, you wouldn't think that I was also an audiobook narrator. I've been suffering from a sinus infection for nearly three weeks, and obviously none of the publishers I work with want to hear me narrating anything right now, because I sound like this. So uh, <laughs> technical hint number one is stay healthy. But I'm looking forward to picking up lots of technical ideas tonight that I could put to use in my own work, should I ever be healthy again. We've got two very knowledgeable presenters this evening, Vanessa Hart and Julie Williams. I'll turn things over to Julie in just a moment so you don't have to listen to this voice much longer. But I wanted to cover some quick housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send a link in a few days where you can either stream or download the webinar. So you don't have to take notes tonight, you'll have a recording. Second, we're going to allow around 30 minutes for questions at the end of the presentations. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box you'll see on your GoToWebinar control panel. The conference organizers will see your questions and then relay them to the presenters. During the webinar, all of the participants' audio lines are muted just to keep background noise to a minimum. For those of you who will be reading scripts tonight, we'll unmute you when it's your turn. Sometimes we experience feedback or echo if you've got studio monitors right next to the mic that you're using. If that's the case, just turn down your monitors and everything should be fine. And now I'd like to introduce Julie Williams of voiceovers.com and have her take over this evening's presentation. Julie's an active audiobook narrator herself, and she's been an Audi finalist and has done thousands of commercials, medical narrations, and more. She's also the publisher of the VoiceOver Insider magazine. Julie, welcome. Thank you. I also want to mention, if you're one of the people who's going to be reading with us tonight, I'm sorry that everybody couldn't do it. With so many people, it's kind of difficult to do that. But I wanted to let you know that um, just because we've sent you a script doesn't necessarily mean you'll get to read. We appreciate it, and our plan is that you will. But you know what it's like when you're doing a live show, things happen. And uh, it may be that once we unmute you, we aren't able to get a good sound, and then we just need to go on to the next person. So we hope nobody is offended or hurt by that. And also, those of you who volunteered to read after we had all the slots filled, thank you so much for doing that. We know that you will also get great benefit from listening listening to the lessons and then the critique of other talent. Kind of works that way, you know, you learn from yourself getting critiqued and you learn from other people getting critiqued, things that uh, maybe you wouldn't have even thought of. Um, tonight we're going to learn all aspects of becoming a successful audiobook narrator. Um, other webinars in our series you can find out about by going to voiceovers.com slash webinars. That would be voiceovers.com rather than comma com. That's my typing, the long fingernails, right? Voiceovers.com forward slash webinars. And there is where you can get future webinars and also past webinars that we've done. And you can go to voiceovers.com to subscribe to the free VoiceOver Insider. It's voice-overs.com. And that's a magazine. If you're not a member, you, you really should become one because it's free to sign up. Every month you will get um, a, a magazine that's 20 to 40 pages full of articles written by some of the best top people in the industry, including Vanessa Hart and myself, um, and some other uh, top talent who you've heard on webinars, who you've seen at uh, VO 2013 Atlanta or um, at Voice 20, you know, whatever it was, 2012, 2010. Um, 2008. So be sure to sign up for the VoiceOver Insider. It's free. You can unsubscribe any time, of course. And that's also, also a way that you can be sure that you'll be notified anytime we have another webinar. Tonight you're going to learn what most narrators don't know that they need to do before voicing an audiobook, 12 guidelines for acting and audiobook, specific performance techniques for doing this, and also critiques of individual attendees you're going to learn from, uh, from everybody, including yourself, if you're being critiqued. Vanessa Hart is our special guest. She is an earphone winner and an Audi finalist. She's done more than 60 audiobooks. 
She is a fabulous audiobook coach. She's taught with the, my three voice guitars. I've put together a group that teaches commercial, medical, narration, and um, audiobook. And, and she's always my first choice to teach audiobook because she has not only a dynamic personality, but a gift at teaching and at laying it all out to where it's not as complicated. You know, it doesn't seem as complicated as it can. Um, she just simplifies everything so that anybody can do it. So, um, Vanessa, I am so glad that you, you are here to join us. Hi, thank you so much, Julie. That's a lovely introduction. I'm so <laughs> pleased to be here. Okay, I'm going to give you as much as I can in the time allotted to me. And um, be sure you have your pencil ready. And um, hopefully, we'll be able to take questions at the very end. All right, the first thing I'm going to talk about. Are your characters? You wanna you wanna do this prep, even for an audition. It's the difference between getting hired and not getting hired. I like to think of this as casting a film, but you're casting a book. So the first thing that you're gonna do when you're reading, um, when you're doing your prep, is write down all of the cues and clues that the author gives you. He said in his uh, lovely deep growly voice, or um, she was as fiery as her hair was red, or um, the voice was like like nails on a chalkboard. Every now and then you'll come across that, and unfortunately, sometimes one of those characters will end up being a major character. So you you want to you have to listen to the author, but then you also have to deal with something. You have to pick something, choose something that is actually listenable for six, eight, nine, eleven, twelve hours. Um, for instance, um, I'm, I'm doing an audition tomorrow, and the first person, it's a first person book, and the, um, it says in the very first chapter that she has a really heavy New Jersey accent. Well, that's an interesting fact that I learned from the author, but it's not actually playable, because the book is an eight hour book. If I do a heavy New Jersey accent for eight hours, everybody is going to, after an hour, you're not going to be able to listen to it anymore. So you, Write it all down, use what you must, and, and leave the rest. Um, when in doubt, never use an accent unless they insist, unless, it, unless the author says again and again in her heavy New Jersey accent or with her sweet southern drawl. Other than that, leave it alone because all it does is it gets in the way between you and your listener. Okay, so now you've done that. You've, you've written everything down that you've been given from the author. Now it's time to cast your book. So for, for everyone who repeats, every character that repeats, you, you're going to want to make some rather intensive notes. But for, we're going to talk about what you're going to do now for your top four characters. If this was a movie, it would be the top four actors with the most lines. And what I like to use is what you're seeing on your screen. And this is from Michael Shirtless Audition. And for those of you who have never taken, taken acting classes, I highly recommend that you purchase this book. I, this was um, a textbook from a theater course that I took many, many years ago. And it's, it's all dog-eared and waterlogged, and I use it continuously. Um, you are not going to have time to run through these 12 guideposts for every single character in your book. But you will find that if you get into the habit of doing it for your top four characters, the rest will will come more naturally and it, and, and it will come faster. And you'll, find, you'll also find that by doing this, you'll develop pocket reads. You'll have pocket characters that you can pull out of your pocket at, at, a, at an instant and, and apply because, because you've done all this work. It's sort of like in animation, you have to have a good 10 to 15 characters that are in your basket and you need to be able to pull them out at a moment's notice. The same thing happens with audiobooks because you'll find, your, yeah, you're going to have your top four characters, but in a lot of audiobooks, Sometimes you'll have 30 repeating characters, 35 repeating characters. Or you'll have 35 repeating characters, and you'll be doing a series, and they'll repeat from book to book to book to book. So you want, this is where your research really comes in handy. It's also, these are also very helpful if, if you find that you have a character that you don't like, because you can't play a character that you don't like. So if you use these guidelines, you'll be able to get into the character and figure out exactly from that character's point of view what, what makes that character tick. And once you have empathy with the character, then you'll find your way in. Because just playing a villain 
doesn't work. Unless it's a really tiny, tiny little part, then you can pull out your character villain out of your pocket. But otherwise, it, they have to be full, fully fleshed out characters. So the, this is a little guideline. And in, the, and in the book, in Audition, there's a chapter on each of these. This is based on how to audition for, for a play. But it works. Every, it's the same thing. Acting is acting is acting, whether you're in front of the camera, whether you're on the stage, or you are narrating an audio book. The difference here is, is we get to play all of the parts. So what you want to do is you want to ask yourself about each character. Number one, the relationship. What is the relationship to the other characters in the book? Is this my lover? Is this um, my sister? And if so, how do we get along? Um, number two, what are you fighting for? Where is the conflict? There is conflict in every single scene. And the conflict is, I want something, and you're not giving it to me fast enough. So you want to figure out what's happening in every chapter, every scene. And I find it also extremely helpful to, at the top of each chapter, write a three to four sentence synopsis of what's happening. Just, just the highlights. Oh, John is fighting to get Joan to, um, to marry him. If we're going to be really, really simple. Excuse me. Turn off my air conditioner. Um, so you want to know what you're fighting for and, and why it is that you're not getting it immediately. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a fight. Um, number three is the moment before. This is really important. This is going to give you place, tone, atmosphere, what happened right before you start that chapter. What happened right before your heroine opens her mouth? Why does she open her mouth in the first place? Where has she been? How was her day? Is it, is it, is it daylight? Is it evening? Is she uh, coming home from work and was it a good day? Or does she come into the house and everything's a mess? The children are screaming, the husband is nowhere to be found. So you want to firmly know what your moment before is, before you speak. Four is humor. A lot of narrators and a lot of actors, no matter what the medium, leave this one out. You need to find the humor in the scene. It is always there. Um, even if someone is dying uh, or someone has just died, there's usually a moment where someone else is trying to make it okay. So look for it. It, it may not be there. I'm sorry. It may not be there in some scenes. It depends on how good the writer is. But in really good writing, it's always there. It's sort of like uh, misery and joy sitting on the same bench. And really good writers put it all in there for you. And that leads us right into number five, which is the opposite. So if, uh, if, if using the example before, if someone has just died and this is, and this is a, a scene about mourning, where, where is the other thing? Where is the love? Where is the gentleness? Where is the empathy? Where is the humor? Find the opposite. If you read, if you read a, a chapter and you go, oh, well, this is what this chapter is about. Turn that on its head and see what that teaches you. You'll almost always find something that you never even saw before, which leads you right into number six, discovery. What, what is actually happening in the scene? What do you learn that you didn't know beforehand? That's why, that's why books are grouped into chapters, because something happens. So you need to know where you're driving the chapter to. This is really a difficult thing. This is the fine line that narrators have to walk who do fiction. Because we need to lead the listener to where we know the book is going without them ever knowing that they're being led, number one. And number two, discovering in the moment. You have to discover in the moment, even though you already know. But you have to allow the character to discover in the moment as you are being the maestro of the entire piece, if that makes sense sense to you. Communication and competition. This is simply about allowing every character to be heard. Sometimes you'll find a character that you don't like or it's a really minor character, but I can promise you that if that character is in there, there's something to be said, something to be heard. So be sure that all of your characters are listening to each other. So, and this will also keep you from doing the run-on sentence where you're not stopping because it's not, it's not natural. When people talk to each other, People stop, even if it's just how, with the exception maybe of how are you today, and then people just automatically answer that. But everything else, if you think about it, people look at you, they listen, they react, and then they regurgitate. That's the communication. And it has to go both ways, just as if you were on stage. 
except here you have to play all the parts. And that's where the competition comes in. No, you have to listen to me. You're not listening to me. That's also an opposite. And what are you fighting for and a relationship? Once you start using all of these and, and you put this into practice on a regular basis, you'll see how they all flow together. And as I said, it's exactly as if you were prepping to do a role on stage. Um, importance. Find the importance. If it doesn't seem to be important, make it important. Uh, find the events. This is exactly just simply what is happening. Um, in this chapter, Joe goes to the store. Joe gets held up at the store. Joe gets into a um, gets into an argument with a policeman who comes to the store. That, exactly what's going to happen. So you know exactly where you're going before you open your mouth. And also, you and and every chapter has an arc. Just like every scene has an arc. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you need to know when you're going up the hill and when you're going down the hill. Because what you never want to do is come to the end of a chapter and surprise the listener. You want the listener to know that you're coming to the end of a chapter, that you're wrapping things up. And there are many different ways to close. You can simply slow your pace. You can slow it way, way, way down. But you need to lead because, as I said, you're the maestro. Place. This goes um, back to the moment before. Where are you? It's going to make a big difference. If you're sitting, um, if you picture yourself um, sitting on a couch with your best friend, having a cocktail in front of the fire, that's a totally different energy than if you and a bunch of your girlfriends are um, out at a club. Uh, game playing and role playing, well, we all do that. Oh, I'm pretending that I'm being the smart one, and you're pretending that you're learning. Uh, mystery and secret. Pretty much everybody's got a mystery, a secret. So try to figure out what that is and hold that dear. But also, if you know what it is, you'll be able to lead the listener. Now, after you've cast everything, you've cast all of your characters, I'm going to suggest to you a little bitty shortcut, which is what I call a reference. Um, it helps if you watch a lot of television, like I do, but, or a lot of movies. So you can put down, for instance, uh, I, if I see my hero as uh, Russell Crowe. Okay, I see him in Russell Crowe in what movie? If I see my heroine as Nicole Kidman, what movie? Is it Bewitched or is it something something heavier? I cast everyone like that because then I and I write that down right next to the character name, along with oh, their voice is slightly higher than mine or their voice is slightly lower than mine. I always write down a reference from uh, television or movies, simply because it immediately brings to mind. It, it really helps if you, like, for instance, if you watch shows that are, that are weekly shows, that are procedurals and serials, because then you're going to really know those people, and you're going to know how they would dress and how they talk and how they move, or they, you're going to know whether or not they're legato or they're staccato when they talk. It's going to make a big difference. And if you can put, just put a reference down there, it's gonna, going to allow you to get there really, really fast. And then you want to make a little note about how that voice differs from yours. Is it higher? Is it lower? Is there less lip flap or more lip flap? Uh, is there an accent? Uh, is staccato, legato? Anything that will help you. I used to write really, really, really long voice descriptions. Now I've, I've got it down to about three or four words. But um, it's a great shortcut, um, especially if you watch soap operas. <laughs> If you watch soap operas, you've got a cast of thousands, and you know them really, really well. But it works, it works with anything. It works with films. It works with anything. And now I want to talk about the other character, the forgotten character, which is the narrator. So, okay. Who is the narrator? Lots of people, lots of students who start out with me, they say, well, it's me. Well, it's not you. It's never you, ever. If it's first person, then it is whoever the book is about. And then you have all, you have all kinds of information, which is, which is quite wonderful. Um, and what you want to ask yourself in a first-person story is, who are you telling the story to? Because you already know who you are in a first-person narration. Um, who are you telling the story to? Why are you telling them the story? Why do you have to open your mouth and share this eight-hour story with this person? Where are you? Again, are we sitting outside having a cocktail, or are we in the car on a long road trip? Place is going to make a big difference. As soon as you know who you're talking to, why 
you have to tell the story. And where you are, you are miles ahead of most narrators who never bother with this at all. You also want to know how far removed you are from the actual events in the story, because that makes a difference. Think about it. Um, for instance, I just broke my wrist. Um, that was a very dramatic story six weeks ago um, when it first happened. It's a much less dramatic story now that I'm in physical therapy. So if, you, if, this, is, if this story is something that just happened, or if this, uh, if this story is something that happened 20 years ago and you're telling it to your granddaughter, that gives you a, totally, a total difference in tone. And it's going to make a difference because it gives you something to hang your hat on. If you have answered these questions, who are you telling the story to? Why do you have to tell the story? Where are you? And how far removed are you from the actual events in the story last week, yesterday, 20 years ago? That is going to firmly entrench you in the narration. And I can tell immediately. And so can every other listener. They just don't know what it is. I can tell immediately if someone has done this work because they are immediately invested in the story. I don't know who they're talking to, why or where they are, but they know. And you can tell the difference. Now, if it's a third-person story, this is, it, it gets a little more complicated because then you have to figure out who is talking, and, and you have no hints. This you have to totally just make up. Basically, you, just, you, you pull it out of a hat. You figure out something that works. Um, but don't, never choose a crowd, number one. Oh, I'm telling this to a bunch of people because you're, that's not invested, and that becomes um, very presentational, which is not what you want. When you're doing audio book work, what you want is to create as much intimacy as possible. You want to pull them in. Uh, get, get the listener so that the listener is, is breathing with you. So the choices that you make here need to be really important to you. Because no one is ever going to, well, somebody might, because occasionally it does happen. Um, you'll have a director who will go, okay, who was your third person? Because they can tell. Um, they can tell who you were. Uh, they can tell that you were invested. So I always make it something really personal for myself, really high stakes. Oh, okay, I'm going to decide that the people in this book had a child, and the child is now asking the mother, and I am the mother in the book, I, is now saying, why are we at war? Why are we still at war? And how did you meet? And I'm going to say, let me tell you, let me tell you that whole story, and I'm going to be sitting by her bedside and telling it to her night after night about how it started. Now, nobody cares about this choice that I've made, but it invests my reading and my narration with gravitas, heft. Okay, that's all I got. Now we're going to have some readers. Who we got? Carol? Well, it says I'm unmuted, so I guess I say aloha. This is Carol from Maui. Sorry, I was yeah. muted when I was talking away. <laughs> yeah, Carol, okay. can you hear me now? Carol? Yes. Hi. Hello, darling. How are you? I'm good, baby. How are you? I'm fine. Okay. You want to give this a go for me? You're doing the quickie, right? I'm doing the quickie. Okay. Uh, uh, do you want me to slate it or just start? Just start. Just start. Jesus, God, help me, I thought. My next thought was even weirder. When I was seven years old, I caught a men's softball game lying dry right in my chest. It was at our Bronx Irish neighborhood's annual NYPD versus FDNY barbecue. And it happened as I was on the finest first baseline, cheering on my patrol sergeant dad, who was on the mound pitching. I don't remember the ball hitting me, don't remember a thing about it. They said my heart actually stopped. My father had to give me CPR until they defibrillated me. I don't remember any light at the end of a tunnel or any sweet-faced guardian angels beckoning me heavenward. Only pain. And the silently moving mouths of the adults looking down on me, seen as if through an incredibly thick piece of glass. I felt the same sense of disconnection as I looked down and saw the warm brown eyes staring up at me through a foot of bloody rainwater. I almost hugged Scott right there and then. Almost dropped right into the water beside him in all my clothes. Wrapped my arms around him. Except I was unable to move. 
I remember the first time we met at the 48th precinct under the Cross Bronx Expressway. I was working overtime in the homicide squad room upstairs, and Scott was working OT out of narcotics downstairs. Well, the soda machine in the mustard room wouldn't take my dog. He gave me one of his, and when I hit the button, two Diet Cokes dropped down. Don't worry, Scott said, smiling. You could almost hear the click as our eyes met. I won't tell internal affairs. I swallowed as the rain fell around me now. I eyed the tiny circles it was making over Scott's dead eyes. One of the uniforms I did him, named Scott Thayer, Mike said. He's a detective from Bronx Narcotics. One of us, Laura. This is as bad as it gets. Somebody killed a cop. My hands went up to my leaking eyes. I contemplated ripping them out. He was beaten very badly, my partner continued, sounding to me like he was speaking from somewhere out past Pluto. I nodded. Tell me something I don't know, I thought. Then Mike did. Beaten to a pulp, he said, anger seeping into his voice. And then somebody shot him. Very nice. Nicely done, honey. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was nice. Um, I, I really like what you did with Mike, about how you kind of sat on your voice for him. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that worked out very well. What I would have liked to have heard, um, at the end, where it says anger seeping into his voice, I, yeah. I, didn't, hear, I didn't hear that. I, okay. I, I, I envision it with his, his teeth almost clenched. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then at the and then at the top of the piece, um, I do believe that it would be more interesting if you allowed each of those uh, th those first two lines to be totally different. Uh, Jesus, God help me, I thought is is a total wow. And then you need to stop dead before you go into my next thought was even weirder. And then okay. when it gets into and then when it gets into when I was seven years old, um, I think that can move. That can that can be that can be the detective speaking until she gets to um, and saw warm brown eyes. That that way you hit all the beats in the piece. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Julie. Yeah, I'm here. You know, um, my thought was I think there could be a little bit uh, more natural pacing throughout it. I thought she did a very good job. You did a, a good job, Carol. At, at the very beginning where Vanessa was talking about, you know, pausing from the first two lines, I also would have liked to feel the fact that you were thinking with the Jesus God, uh -huh. please, please, I thought, okay? Yeah, almost pseudo breath even, right? Yeah, and then the next is, my next thought was even weirder. So yeah. you're really stressing the fact, I want to feel in that first line that you're thinking, and then you're letting us know your next thought was, weirder through this whole thing you're recounting but recounting and thinking out loud can be slightly different so that's just um, my two cents I, I, I totally agree uh, uh, Jesus God help me um, I, I, I think it, it, you can treat it almost like it's in parentheses you know like it's what? God help me yeah oh yes okay Jesus God help me I thought and mm -hmm. then and then we move on, and even weirder, and that's and that's a thought in and of itself. And then we pick up the pace. Uh, Julie? Okay. Julie? Yes, I'm here. Honey, do we have time to have uh, to have them read again or no? Um, let's see. What what time is it? I don't see that. It's six thirty-two. It's six thirty-two. Yeah, we can do that. Um, we may not be able to as we get toward the end have everybody get a second chance because we do have two readers per script. Okay. But so it what might we help us. You know, just, just do the, like the first page. Yeah, let's do the first page. Do you mind doing the first page again, Carol? No, I can do that. Great, let's just do the first page. Oh, wait, the first page. Okay. Jesus, God, help me, I thought. My next thought was even weirder. When I was seven years old, I caught a men's softball game line drive right in my chest. It was at our Bronx Irish neighborhood's annual NYPD versus FDNY barbecue. 
and it happened as I was on the finest first baseline, cheering on my patrol sergeant dad, who was on the mound pitching. I don't remember the ball hitting me, don't remember a thing about it. They said that my heart actually stopped. My father had to give me CPR until they defibrillated me. I don't remember any light at the end of the tunnel, or any sweet-faced guardian angels beckoning me heavenward. Only pain. And the silently moving mouths of the adults looking down at me, seen as if through an incredibly thick piece of glass. I felt the exact same sense of disorientation as I looked down. Very nice. So, Nicely done. Nicely done, Carol. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Excellent. Thank you. Aloha. Okay, our next reader, our next reader is JC Kirkpatrick to do the same thing, to do the quickie. Okay. Yes. Um, is that a yes, like you're on, JC? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Oh, good. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's good to okay. hear you again, Vanessa. Hey, JC. Okay, full disclosure, uh, JC is an ex-student of mine and is now a well-employed audiobook narrator. How many books have you done now? I have 15. Yeah, that's awesome. my girl. Go yeah. on. Yeah, because okay. you're that good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you did all the work. Okay. Rock my world, sweetheart. All right. Jesus, God help me, I thought. My next thought was even weirder. When I was seven years old, I caught a men's softball game line drive right in my chest. It was at our Bronx Irish Neighborhood's annual NYPD versus FDNY barbecue. And it happened as I was on the finest first base line, cheering on my patrol sergeant dad, who was on the mound pitching. I don't remember the ball hitting me. Don't remember a thing about it. They said that my heart actually stopped. My father had to give me CPR until they defibrillated me. I don't remember any light at the end of the tunnel or any sweet-faced guardian angels beckoning me heavenward. Only pain and the silently moving mouths of the adults looking down at me as if through an incredibly thick piece of glass. I felt that exact excuse me. I felt that exact same sense of disconnection as I looked down and saw warm brown eyes staring up at me through a foot of bloody rainwater. I almost hugged Scott right there and then, almost dropped right into the water beside him on all my clothes, wrapped my arms around him, except I was unable to move. I remember the first time we met at the 48th precinct under the Cross Bronx Expressway. I was working overtime in the homicide squad room upstairs and Scott was working OT out of narcotics downstairs when the soda machine in the must room wouldn't take my dollar. He gave me one of his, and when I hit the button, two Diet Cokes dropped down. Don't worry, Scott said, smiling. You could almost hear the click as our eyes met. I won't tell internal affairs. I swallowed as the rain fell around me now. I eyed the tiny circles it was making over Scott's dead eyes. One of the uniforms I'd eat him, named Scott Thayer, Mike said. He's a detective from Bronx Narcotics. One of us, Warren. This is as bad as it gets. Somebody killed the cop. My hands went up to my leaking eyes. I contemplated ripping them out. He was beaten very badly, my partner continued, sounding to me like he was speaking from somewhere out past Pluto. I nodded. Tell me something I don't know, I thought. Then Mike said, beaten to a pulp, he said anger seeping into his voice. And then somebody shot him. Very nice. Really nicely done, honey. Thank you. I, I, I don't really have much here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to point out a couple of things uh, for everyone else listening. Um, uh, they said that my heart actually stopped. Um, JC did something really nice there at, that I was talking about in the beginning. She discovered that. She let that happen in the moment. My heart actually stopped. Like even even recalling it now with everything else going on is sort of stunning and still amazing to her. And JC let us have that moment. Really nicely done. And uh, and then except I wasn't able to move. I love the way that you totally separated that out. You didn't pause too long, but you let it you let it sit for a minute. And I also really loved 
what you did with um, when our eyes, um, uh, you could almost hear the click as our eyes met. I could hear the fondness in your voice and, and the warmth in your voice. Again, the only note that I have here is beaten to a pulp. It's same note that I gave Carol. I really, I really think at this point, I mean, this is a cop, and a cop is down. I think it's beaten to a pulp, and then somebody shot him. I think this guy is barely controlling his rage. Yeah. It is the it is, and that's the only note I have. Julie, do you have anything? Yeah. Um, yeah, what I would say is um, very nice job. I really liked the varied pacing throughout the whole thing. There's nothing more boring than listening to an audiobook that's the same pace throughout the whole thing. Amen, um, sister. And I, I like the way she was in the moment, like you said when she was talking about her heart stopping. And, and another place where I really heard that was um, the discovering it as she goes with Jesus, God help me, I thought. Yeah. You know, it was oh, discovering okay. as God. And, the, and my next thought was weirder. I mean, that was also being discovered as it was happening. Yep, yep, yep. So the only thing that I would say, and, um, and, and this could be, oh, uh, when, um, when the two Cokes come out, and I won't, I won't tell internal affairs, maybe a slight bit of humor on that, you know, yeah. just a slight bit of, you know, him saying, don't worry, I won't tell internal affairs with a little bit of, you know, he's, you know, teasing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, uh, make sure that your phrasing comes where you want it to, like you normally do, and you breathe then. Now, there's one place where you may have uh, phrased at the at the time you wanted to and breathed and took a breath then, but it sounded a little bit awkward. And that is on page one, and I'm looking for the spot. Okay, uh, the mouths of adults looking down at me. Okay, it kind yeah. of sounded like an awkward pause so that you could breathe rather than you breathing where the natural pause should have been. Does that make sense? Yeah, the nerves hit me. <laughs> yeah. I could hear your nerves, cutie. <laughs> yeah, nerves are not, you don't have to, you know what? You're just listening, you know, Vanessa and I are, are going to be critiquing you and, and everybody else is saying, oh, thank God it's not me. <laughs> well, that's happened when I've done public speaking and I was PTA president. Nerves would hit me right in the middle of what I was doing. I was like, come on, they're going to kill you. They would have killed you already. Just relax. And then I calm down and go back to me. But yeah, nerves hit me right in there. And I'm like, ah, calm down. <laughs> yeah, you, you did a great, you just, it was just really quite lovely. They're just yes. very nice work. God, you're good, girl. Okay. Thank you, man. And you know, for the benefit of anybody else that is going to read for us, neither Vanessa nor I believe in beating people up and telling them to get out of the business. We believe in telling them what their strengths are and what they can work on because that's yeah. really what we need. Well, thank okay, you. moving on. Can we move to Orchid Blues? Thank you so much, JC. Thank you, ma'am. Now, the third page, I'm going to have to scroll down, but uh, we have first up Frederick Humberstone. Hello, Frederick. can you hear me? Yes, Hello? hi, Frederick. Hi, how are you this evening? I'm excellent. Thank you for reading for me. Oh, you're more than welcome. This sounds like fun. <laughs> Good, so you're not going to get nervous in the middle, right? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Men. Okay. You want okay. me to start? Yeah, Very take good. it away. Holly Barker opened her eyes and felt for Jackson. His side of the bed was empty and she could hear the shower running. She moved her hand to the warm place on her stomach and found Daisy's head. She scratched behind an ear and was answered with a small sigh. Daisy was a Doberman pincher and she liked to sleep with her head on Holly's belly. Holly heard the shower turn off, and a moment later, Jackson's bare feet padding across the bedroom carpet. She raised her head, tucked a pillow under it, and eyed him, naked, wet hair, in a hurry. She liked him naked. So, she said, where am I going on my honeymoon? Same place as I am, Jackson replied, stepping into his boxer shorts and selecting a white shirt from a drawer. I'm relieved to hear it, she said. And where is that? Some place you'll probably like, he said. Probably like? You're not even sure I'm going to like it? I think you will, he said. But in the immortal words of Fats Waller, one never knows, do one. This is how you treat your wife? I don't have a wife. You will by high noon or my daddy will shoot you. Ham wouldn't shoot me. He's too nice a guy. 
He would if he knew you wouldn't tell me where I'm going on my honeymoon. He knows, and that's enough for Ham. Wait a minute, she said. My father knows where I'm going on my honeymoon, and your wife doesn't? I told you, I don't have a wife. You're driving me crazy, she said, falling back onto the pillow. If you don't pull that sheet over your breast, you're going to drive me crazy, he replied, looking at her in the mirror. She kicked the sheet off completely, disturbing Daisy's sleep. Take that, she said. I intend to, he said. When we arrive in, what you call it? Why are you rushing off? She asked seductively. Don't point that thing at me, Jackson said. I've got a closing in half an hour. Then I have to do some dictating before I leave the office. And then, on the way to the courthouse, I have to pick up the tickets at the travel agents and stop at the bank for some traveler's checks. Why didn't you have the tickets sent here? She asked. Because you would have ripped them open to find out where you're going on your honeymoon. Tell you what, if you'll call yourself Mrs. Oxenhandler for the rest of your life, I'll tell you where you're going on your honeymoon. Jackson, I keep telling you, nobody would choose to be called Mrs. Oxenhandler. You're stuck. You were born with it. Can you imagine my cops calling me Chief Oxenhandler? They couldn't keep a straight face. I think that's a very dignified name for a chief of police, Jackson said, trying to look hurt. It's a very dignified name for someone who handles oxen, she said. Well, he sighed, I guess you'll find out where you're going on your honeymoon when you get there. See you at the courthouse, he said. In Judge Chandler's courtroom, and you'd better be there early, she called after him. She fell back on the bed. She would always remember that picture of him, standing in the doorway in his white linen suit and gold tie, with his hair still wet. Nice. Nicely done. Okay. Thank you. Okay, here we go. So, uh, just a little housekeeping. Um, whenever um, you move from the character back to the narrator, you have to pause. For instance, you're driving me crazy. Beat, she said, falling back onto the pillow. You can never run that together, okay? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, go and... ahead and beat me up. I'm a guy. I can take it. <laughs> so you can never run that together. And um, so you just need to be really careful that you don't get into the habit of doing that because uh, the directors will slap you down for it. Very good. Um, okay. And um, can um, at the end of the piece, um, you, there's something called a classic close, um, but any close will do. When, you, when you're coming to the end of something, you want to, um, as I was saying earlier, you want to telegraph that it's coming to an end. So... After you do in Judge Chandler's courtroom, and you'd better be there early. Now, for instance, right here it says she called after him. So that's that you have to do that. So instead of just saying in Judge Chandler's courtroom, and you better be there early, it's going to be like in Judge Chandler's courtroom, and you better be there early. You see what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am, I do. She, mm -hmm. Okay, she's calling to him as he's walking out the door. You can't actually increase in volume on the mic. But what you do is you increase your vocal intensity. And um, a way to get to that is to, uh, to put your fists up in the air and clench them. That will give you the intensity that you need. And it will sound like volume, but anybody that's listening on earbuds will not have to pull them out of their ears. And then, and then I, after... What? Do I still uh, have a little beat to skip between early and she called after him? Exactly. Okay. Or early. She called after him, and now you want to close it out. She fell back on the bed. She would always remember that picture of him standing in the doorway in his white linen suit and gold tie with his hair still wet. Ooh, you're good. <laughs> it's a trick. It's a classic <laughs> clothes, and it impresses the heck out of everybody. So steal it from me and use it often. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you want to work a little bit on your male-female, um, and I'm guessing you didn't have enough time to actually pick references. But if you pick references, you'll find that you're, um, it, it doesn't even matter if they live on the same vocal plane, but they can't have the same vocal rhythm. Well, I tried to do a little bit of practicing prior after uh -huh. I, I got Julie's email and printed the script. 
But uh, what I found myself doing is drifting in between the narrator and Jackson. And I'd get to the end of the script and I thought, wait a minute, I've, trade, I've traded places here with the voice. It's okay. I've got to be careful. Well, as a man, you're going you're gonna to place Jackson because Jackson is the lead. You're going to place him. He's going to be your voice. You're going to place him as close to your voice in your bailiwick as you can because you'll have to sustain him for nine hours. Mm -hmm. You're just going to you're going to you're going to pick a really a, a reference that's vital and meet something in your head so that when he speaks, even though he's in your vocal tone, he talks a little differently. Either he's a little more butch, he's a little more like this, or he's a little more like that. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a slightly different rhythm than your normal rhythm so that when you move back into the narrator, there's a difference and it and can that's, clearly that's, be heard. That's the mistake I was making, but of course I didn't know it was a mistake at the time until your, your lecture just earlier. Of and course. that's creating a character for the narrator. Exactly, exactly. And if you don't do it, you see what happens. Exactly, um, yes. And, and, and something else I want, and, and another note, that, and that it's all here for you. Um, for instance, she, it, it, in the beginning, you eventually got to where you needed to be, but you started where you needed to. You started where you needed to end up. Where you needed to start was with her being just waking up, which is a totally different sort of languid. She raised okay. her head, tucked the pillow under it, and eyed him. So, you see what Everything I'm saying? Everything slower paced. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. then when they start to speak, she has her first speaking of the morning voice, and he has the I just got out of the shower voice. And then so, I, that, that pace can change when she sees him naked out of the shower. That's when it's going to pick up. As it, well, It's going to pick up as she wakes up. Mm -hmm. It's going to pick up as she wakes up, because no matter what, no matter naked or not, the first words you speak in the morning, are, they're, spoken, they're spoken differently than, at, than 10 minutes later. But you never want to present it as being raspy like, like I am when I get up in the morning. No, uh, why not? Why would you not do that? Why I would do that. I would do that. Yeah, really? I would, absolutely, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Absolutely. Okay, I want you to, I want you to think for just one minute about just, just, just figure out who you're talking to. Just figure out who you're talking to. If you uh, make it your wife or, your, or somebody that you're going to tell this story to, and then I just want you to do this first page for me again with uh, a definite narrator in mind talking to someone personal and with her just waking up. Just do that first page again. I'm sorry, Julie, did you have anything? Um, you know, mostly uh, you, you already said it. The only thing I would have said is in the uh, part where she's being seductive um, about where, why are you rushing off. Um, I think it could have sounded a little bit more seductive and I think the words were just kind of said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could. Okay. You just have to be careful. You can't play seduction. You have to really be in the moment. I, I, I don't have much practice at that. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, it's like whenever there's a sex scene, don't work it, man. You know, <laughs> just, just get through it. Okay, All let's right. Try that. Let's try that first, just that first page, please. Holly Barker opened her eyes and felt for Jackson. His side of the bed was empty, and she could hear the shower running. I want to stop you. I want to stop you. Who are you talking going, to? Going too fast? Yeah, who are you talking to? Uh, don't know. Just okay. Can't Take figure that out. Are you married? Uh, no, I'm not. Do you have a girlfriend? Not currently. Well, okay. Talk to your, your most favorite girlfriend from the past. <laughs> and nice and slow. This is first thing in the morning. Lead us into it nice and slowly. Holly Barker opened her eyes and felt for Jackson. His side of the bed was empty, and she could hear the shower running. She moved her hand to the warm place on her stomach and found Daisy's head. She scratched behind an ear and was answered with a small sigh. Daisy was a Dober Doberman pincher, and she liked to sleep with her head on Holly's belly. Holly heard the shower turn off, and a moment later, Jackson's bare feet padding across the bedroom carpet. She raised her head, tucked a pillow under it, and eyed him, naked, wet hair, in a hurry. She liked him naked. So, she said, where am I going on my honeymoon? Same place as I am, 
Jackson replied, stepping into his boxer shorts and selecting a white shirt from a drawer. I'm relieved to hear it, she said. And where is that? Some place you'll probably like, he said. Probably like? You're not even sure I'm going to like it? Much better. Much, much, much better. Julie, do you have anything? No, I think that was much better. Yeah, Thank okay. You. Actually, Thank there, was, you. there was just one place, but this is a mistake. It's not a pattern. So mistakes don't matter. But uh, just remember, um, when you continue to do this, always to have that pause between the dialogue and the narrator. Because there was one place, some place you'll probably like, he said. Yep. You, you need to pause it. But that's that's really hardly worth mentioning because unless it's a pattern like the first time you did it, then it's just a mistake, and mistakes are fine. Everyone makes mistakes. You just redo the mistake. And I can, I, can, I, I can see your point, and I understand your point. What uh, I, uh, I find myself doing is it's, it's easy to make that pause if I'm switching from a, a female voice to a narrator voice. But when I go from a male narrator voice to a male character voice, that's where it catches me. That's where I've got to be careful. And, that, and that's where it's even more important. Mm -hmm. That's where it's even more important, that you stop dead, dead in the water. Just stop dead. Otherwise, you, it starts to become very confusing. Who's Jackson and who's the narrator? Mm -hmm. If you stop, you've, given your, you've, already, you've already won half the game. Because th just by stopping, you separated them. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Frederick. And now we're looking for Al. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Al. How you doing? Good. How are you this evening? Oh, just fine, thanks. You want to give her a go? Sure. Okay. All right. Holly Barker opened her eyes and felt for Jackson. His side of the bed was empty, and she could hear the shower running. She moved her hand to the warm place on her stomach and found Daisy's head. She scratched behind an ear and was answered with a small sigh. Daisy was a Doberman pincher, and she liked to sleep with her head on Holly's belly. Holly heard the shower turn off, and a moment later, Jackson's bare feet padding across the bedroom carpet. She raised her head tucked a pillow under it, and eyed him, naked, wet hair, in a hurry. She liked him, naked. So, she said, where am I going on my honeymoon? Same place I am, Jackson replied, stepping into his boxer shorts and selecting a white shirt from a drawer. I'm relieved to hear it, she said. And where is that? Some place you'll probably like, she he said. Probably like? You're not even sure I'm going to like it? I think you will, he said. But in the immortal words of Fats Waller, one never knows, do one. This is how you treat your wife? I don't have a wife. You will by high noon or my daddy will shoot you. <laughs> Ham wouldn't shoot me. He's too nice a guy. He would if he knew you wouldn't tell him where I'm going on my honeymoon. He knows. That's enough for Ham. Wait a minute, she said. My father knows where I'm going on my honeymoon, and your wife doesn't? I told you, I don't have a wife. You're driving me crazy, she said, falling back onto the pillow. If you don't pull that sheet over your breasts, you're going to drive me crazy, he replied, looking at her in the mirror. She kicked the sheet completely off, disturbing Daisy's sleep. Take that, she said. I intend to, he said, when we arrive in what you call it. Why are you rushing off, she asked seductively. Don't point that thing at me, Jackson said. I've got a closing in half an hour. Then I have to do some dictating before I leave the office, and then, on the way to the courthouse, I have to pick up the tickets at the travel agents and stop at the bank for some traveler's checks. Why didn't you have the tickets sent here? she asked. Because you would have ripped them open to find out where you're going on your honeymoon. Tell you what. 
If you'll call yourself Mrs. Oxenhandler for the rest of your life, I'll tell you where you're going on your honeymoon. Jackson, I keep telling you, nobody would choose to be called Mrs. Oxenhandler. You're stuck. You were born with it. Can you imagine my cops calling me Chief Oxenhandler? They could keep a straight face. I think that's a very dignified name for a chief of police, Jackson said, trying to look hurt. It's a very dignified name for someone who handles oxen, she said. Well, he, he sighed, I guess you'll find out where you're going on your honeymoon when you get there. In Judge Chandler's courtroom, and you better be there early, she called after him. She fell back on the bed. She would always remember that picture of him, standing in the doorway with his white linen suit and gold tie, with his hair still wet. Nicely done, Al. Do you do audiobooks? I've done a few. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> that, was, that was very nicely done. Right. Um, Al, all I've really got for you is that she seems a, she sounds a little petulant to me, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's simply a, it, it's in his voice too. So it may be part of the rhythm of how you just speak naturally. Um, so you need to be really careful that you make really clear choices with your characters because I don't believe her to be. I, I think in this entire scene she's not petulant at all. I think she's charming and delightful and light and easy and breezy. It's a great day. And she's funny. And she's mm -hmm. sexy. And so I would give her a little more of that and, be, and, and, and watch that particular, you have a little bit of a pedantic thing where you sort of break things up oddly and, 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 you, and you don't want to do that. I, one character can do that. Jackson can talk like that. Or the narrator can talk like that. But they can't all speak like that. Okay. But I, I really love your voice, and I really, uh, I really love the timber in your voice. And um, I like the way that you started slow, and you picked up speed, and you also picked up volume, and then you started to wrap it, and then you wrapped it out very nicely. Um, the um, where he says I intend to this whole little section, um, at the bottom of page two, mm -hmm. um, where she, you know you're driving me crazy. Uh, back, back one, Julie, please. That's page three. I need page two. Thank you. Um, you're driving me crazy, falling back onto the pillow. That gives you something to do. You're driving me crazy. If you can see, you know, she's up and then she flops back on the bed. It's, it's, it's dramatic and, and it's charming. And then, and then his, if you don't pull that sheet over your breast, you're going to drive me crazy. And then when he gets to, I intend to. Here you can lay it on a little bit. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, almost a growl. <laughs> it's from the, if you don't pull that sheet over your breast, I am. Yeah. Kidding. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm going to, yeah, it's going to be great, baby. Whenever we get there, then he immediately <laughs> changes, right? Then right. he gives us the opposite, mm -hmm. which is what we were talking about. He's like real sexy, real serious. And yeah, but I'm not telling you, moving on, got to go. So um, I'd like you to take, um, Julie, do you have anything? You know, I just wanted to say, um, great phrasing. I, I could feel what you were saying, and really good differentiation between the male and female characters. Agreed. I totally agree. What, I, but I'd like to hear him a little more gruff, and I'd like to hear her a little lighter. And I, what I'd like for you to do is start at You're Driving Me Crazy and just read to the bottom of the page, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. <clears throat> really see it in your head. See this little scene between them and all the sexual tension and all the play. You're driving me crazy, she said, falling back onto the pillow. If you don't pull that sheet over your breasts, you're going to drive me crazy, he replied, looking at her in the mirror. She kicked the sheet off, completely off, disturbing Daisy's sleep. Take that, she said. I intend to, he said, when we arrive in what you call it. Why are you rushing off? she asked seductively. Don't point that thing at me, Jackson said. I've got a closing in half an hour, then I have to do some dictating before I leave the office, and then on the way to the courthouse, 
I have to pick up the tickets at the travel agents, then stop at the bank for some traveler's checks. Why didn't you have the tickets sent here? she asked. Because you would have ripped them open to find out where you're going on your honeymoon. Really nice. That's what I'm talking about. That was excellent. You saw something in here that I'd never even seen before. This whole I have to pick up the tickets of the travel agents, that's a taunt. I never saw that before. Well done, Al. Well done. Oh, thanks. <laughs> excellent. Okay, I'm good. Julie, take it away, baby. I got nothing else to add to that. That just sounds great. Yeah. We have a lot of great talented people here. I know. I'm gonna talk um I'm gonna talk mostly about nonfiction and it's actually quite a bit different. Um well it is some different from doing fiction as, as Vanessa teaches. Um nonfiction, contrary to popular belief, is not always boring. Um I've done a number of true crime stories and they unfold kind of like a um well, a story. A murder mystery, perhaps, um, except that usually at the beginning you know who did it, and then they they go back through how they find it out. You know the detective story of how they find it out, and so the narrator is pretty easy to to define. You know it's a uh, written in third person, but it's really easily written by a detective. You know so you know who the narrator is, and that's who you become as the detective. Um, but there are many different kinds of uh, of nonfiction like self-help books and you can just be the instructor in so many of them because so many are like basically glorified narrations so um, a lot of the things that Vanessa is talking about are simpler with nonfiction pieces some of the techniques I just want to quickly go over is number one being in the moment and you could tell that Al was in the moment in what he was just doing um, you could feel what he was saying at that time and he was jumping from character to character being that person as it was happening and what I like about what Vanessa said earlier is um, when she was talking to I think maybe it was JC or Frederick about discovering something as it comes up see that's something that is important as far as being in the moment and it's important when you're telling something when you're teaching something which a lot of nonfiction is doing. Sometimes it's just telling a story, and other times the story is how to do something. <coughs> Forgive me for coughing. Um, I've got the same ailment that uh, that Gary has. We must have both caught it at uh, Voice VO 2013 in Atlanta because um, I didn't. I was self-absorbed enough to not know that he was sick too, <laughs> and we're both just getting the, over that right now, I guess. Um, but being in the moment is the, a very important thing, and I really like it when it can come across as if, sure, I know what's going to happen, but when it can come across as if the listener and I are discovering this at the same time. Obviously, I know what's going to happen, but if I can just be in the moment instead of looking back, unless it, causes, unless it calls for reflection, if I can just be in the moment, then they can experience it with me. And I'm not giving too many hints about what's happening in the future, and I can just tell the story. Another thing is pacing, uh, and, and this is something that, um, who was our first reader? Um, it wasn't JC, it was Carol. And Carol did a good job of pacing. Um, and the pacing was, um, or was it JC that did a good job with pacing? I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, the pacing is is not to be all the same. Like, uh, uh, like Vanessa was saying, you can't, some of the ways you may differentiate characters is that they they talk with different pacing and they talk with different phrasing. Now, if you're confused about pacing and phrasing, pacing is basically how fast you go, okay? And that needs to vary depending on what's happening within the story. If it stays the same, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what is going on around them, then the whole thing, I think, ends up pretty boring and not really sounding true, not really sounding like it's in the moment. And some characters will talk faster than others. Uh, of course, you do always have to have that pause, that differentiation, again, between the he said, she said, and what they're actually saying, you know, between the character and the narrator. Phrasing, I see phrasing as pausing in between a phrase or sentence. 
And sometimes you can actually talk a little faster, have a slightly bigger, faster pace if you are going to phrase a little bit, pausing where we might automatically pause in the middle of the dialogue or even in the middle of the narrator telling the story. Okay, so phrasing means don't start at the capital letter and end at the period and then start over again. You've got to feel it. And again, and this all comes back to being in the moment. And then the next thing is add life to the story. And I say by putting more notes in your song. And um, that is something that I noticed Frederick did. He had a good variety of notes in his song. Um, but don't sound sing-songy. You know, you're, you've got to have all the inflection and the storytelling right. But if you just tell it on the same note the whole time, it's going to be quite a monotone story. And they have to listen to you for 12 hours. God help them. You see what I'm saying? So you might want to add some life to the story. So Frederick did that really well. And, um, and then Al, when he was changing uh, characters, he did some of that too, just by putting the lady just a little bit higher note, you know, a little bit softer coming out. And so um, that can add a lot of life to the story. And it just makes it more interesting. Okay, we're going to have some people read right now. And this story is from the biography of C.S. Lewis that I did a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and I think it shows that not all biographies are boring. In fact, I kind of like biographies. But um, this is all done in third person. Jill Janovitz is the one who's going to be doing this. Jill and William, right? So uh, do Jill Janovitz first. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Jill. I sure can hear you. OK, great. OK, have you had a chance to look at the script? I have, yes. OK, tell us the story. The hungry, frightened young men peered out at a blasted landscape. What they saw resembled a graveyard more than farm fields. Frozen, barren ground studded with twisted metal monuments to the destructive power of modern warfare. The driving snow stung their faces, while the wind seemed to bring together the cries of thousands of wounded men in its unnerving howl. The armies that faced each other that day had endured nearly three years of stalemate. Soon it would be the Somerset Light Infantry's turn to charge into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel, trying to gain ground that no sane person would desire. Then again, insanity was the rule here. No sooner had the dull booming reach no sooner had the dull booming reached the soldiers' ears than they perceived an even more ominous noise of war, the raspy screeching of outgoing artillery shells passing overhead. The boys gasped as instead of the, as instead of the usual faraway thought of impact, some of the rounds exploded with a crash just in front of their position. Okay, good job, Jill. Now, what I liked about what you did is that I could feel that you were feeling what you were doing. What I think can be worked on, though, is it seems to me that when you were emphasizing something, you were kind of punching the words harder and harder when the certain word came. You know what I mean? Yes. As a lot of times, it's better to emphasize something by even getting quieter on it rather than getting louder on it. Because remember, you want to draw the listener into your story. And if you um, get your inflection off or if you, if you start punching words, you're hitting them too hard to emphasize them, it's like slapping them out of the story. Generally, assuming that it's a good book, which you know, a lot of them are, most of them are maybe, um, the words can speak for themselves. So you don't necessarily have to um, punch them real hard. Soon it would be the, the Somerset. In, um, soon it would be the Somerset Light Infantry's turn. Oh, my screen is gone here. Into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel, trying to gain land that no sane person would desire. So I didn't have to punch blizzard. I didn't have to punch mm -hmm. bullets or shrapnel, but just to say it and let the words be felt without punching it is all we need. The light infantry's turn to whatever into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel. Can you feel what I'm saying there? I do, I see. Okay, um, and Vanessa, do you have anything to add to that? 
no. The, 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 uh, the only note that I have on top of that is when, and you're right, Julie, this is beautiful writing. When, when you're given a gift of writing this, this, this nice, um, you, you can, the words will do the work for you, which is basically what Julie was saying. But respect them when you get to, it's unnerving howl. Let howl howl. That's all I've got. Yeah, that's good. So you color the words, but don't ever punch them. Right. Coloring them is making them sound what they sound like, just like what Vanessa is saying. You know, screeching, raspy screeching. They perceived an even more ominous noise. Okay, I didn't go ominous. I just said ominous to make it feel ominous. And after noise, I have my screen cut off, so I can't help you there. But anyway, just, just make sure instead of hitting and punching words, when you want to emphasize them, color them. Or you can pause before them or pause after them if that's how it feels right. But the main key is you have to be telling the story, which means being in the moment. Now, no, you're not there on the battlefield, but you know about this story on the battlefield. You know what happened. Okay. Does that, does that make sense to you, Jill? It does. It does okay, make sense. Okay, why don't you do this, because this is my, my favorite place, because at the beginning you were the, the hungry, frightened young men, but you got better as you went along, and I kind of like the second paragraph better, so why don't you redo the second paragraph for us? Soon it would be the Somerset light infantry's turn to charge into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel, trying to gain ground that no sane person would desire. Then again, insanity was the rule here. No sooner had the dull booming reached the soldier's ear than they perceived an even more ominous noise of the war. The raspy screeching of the outgoing art artillery shells passing overhead. The boys gasped as instead of the usual faraway thud of impact, some of the rounds exploded with a crash just in front of their position. Okay, that was much better. Uh, one other note that I want to mention is your phrasing, which means the pausing within sentences. Don't tie yourself down to the punctuation because these, these books are written for writing. They're not written for reading. And so there might be a pause before and after somebody's name because grammatically that's the correct way to do it. But that's not how you would necessarily read it. So I noticed that your phrasing was really good when you said the boys gasped as instead of the usual whatever of impact, some of the rounds exploded with a crash just wherever their position, just in front of their position or, or whatever it says. Um, that was excellent, but there are commas there. Now, when you were before, no sooner had the dull booming reached their ears than they perceived an even more ominous noise. There was no pausing at all in there. You started with the period, uh, the uh, um, capital and ended with the period. So you can put phrasing in there. No sooner had the dull booming reached their ears than they perceived an even more ominous noise, the raspy screeching of outgoing artillery. You see what I mean? I paused two or three times in there, even though they didn't put a period there. Okay. So remember that you need to feel where you're going and not be locked into um, where they put the periods, because that's not necessarily where the pauses need to be when you're reading. Okay. And gotcha. in fact, you could have said at the bottom, the boys gasped, as instead of the usual, you know what I mean? Instead of the boys gasped, as instead of, it, you could have done it either way. What You could have respected the comma or not respected it. It doesn't matter. Okay. Per gotcha. Okay, Makes sense. Let's move on. And um, this is going, the next one doing this one is going to be um, William Fortier. So I've just unmuted William. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, and you got the C.S. Lewis script, correct? Correct. Okay, good. Then, um, then whenever you're ready, go ahead, and we'll beat you up. No, I'm kidding. You know, <laughs> I'm kidding. but whenever you're ready, okay. we're ready. France, 1918. The hungry, frightened young men peered out at a blasted landscape. What they saw resembled a graveyard more than a farm field. Frozen, barren ground, humans to the destructive power of modern warfare. The driving snow stung their faces, while the wind seemed to bring together the cries of thousands of wounded men in its unnerving howl. The armies that faced each other that day had endured nearly three years of stalemate. Soon, 
It would be the Somerset Light Infantry's turn to charge into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel, trying to gain ground that no sane person would desire. Then again, insanity was the rule here. No sooner had the dull booming reached the soldiers' ears than they perceived an even more ominous noise of war. The raspy screeching of outgoing artillery shells passing overhead. The boys grasped as instead of the usual faraway thought of impact, some of the rounds exploded with a crash just in front of their position. Okay, William, have you done audiobooks before? Yes. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing in this, I, I, have you done this type of genre? Um, not really. Because what I'm hearing is a little bit more, it's a little bit too deliberate in some places, especially toward the end. The words are being so deliberate instead of just kind of telling the story. Um, for example, you pause the cries of thousands of soldiers and um, or of uh, thousands of wounded men um, doesn't really feel like a natural place to stop for me. Now everybody is different and everybody does things differently, but um, that w didn't feel like a natural pause. And then also, um, I think a few more notes in your song would be really good to add a little bit of life to the read. Um, where is it? Where it says they face that day? the armies that actually I don't think it's on here I think it was the extra sentence that isn't that didn't make it onto the screen here oh, okay. so um, <clears throat> the armies they face that day come up on that instead of the armies they face that day and then continuing the armies they face that day blah 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 which I say because I don't have the script in front of me okay. does that make sense to add a, a little bit more life maybe come up sure. a little bit some sentences yeah. because that's what we do when we talk and again, you don't have to be deliberate and stay low because of the ominous feeling of this whole thing. I mean, they're in the trenches. You know, you don't have to do that because, again, the words will tell that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I really like the second. Um, I'll have you do the second paragraph. Well, first, Vanessa, do you have anything to add? Um, no, you, you basically hit it all. He just needs, You just need to pull it all together so that each paragraph has a beginning and a middle and an end for you so that you're staying in the moment and telling me what the author is trying to portray in that particular paragraph instead of I, I'm not sure if you're like reading ahead or exactly what's going on but I'm not feeling that you're leading me from one sentence to the next this is basically what Julie said um, do you want to start with the second paragraph soon it would be the summer shut light infantry's turn and I just want you to tell me like a story don't worry anything about deliberately letting us, you know, know about the sh shrapnel and, you know, and uh, the blizzard of bullets and, and all that. Um, tell it like a story. You can have a little bit of ominous feel because that is what this is, but don't do it overly deliberate because that's part of the, um, part of the, the joy for a listener listening to an audiobook is getting to decide for themselves how to feel. So obviously within it, we have to feel some of it, but we don't have to tell them by overemphasizing. We don't have to tell them how to feel. Um, they can make that decision for themselves. Kind of like what Vanessa was saying, don't really get into the sex scene. Don't act the sex scene. Tell the sex scene and let them feel the way they want to feel it. And it's the same thing here. Don't uh, make them feel too much. You just feel it and tell it. Remember, you're not there in the trenches. You're talking after the fact but then let them see what it was really like. Am I expressing okay. this well enough, William, for you to get what I'm saying? Sure, sure, I was getting too deep there. Okay, well let's start a little bit lighter then on the second paragraph. <clears throat> okay. Soon it would be the Somerset Lights Infantry's turn to charge into a deadly blizzard of bullets and shrapnel, trying to gain ground that no sane person would desire. Then again, insanity was the rule here. No sooner had the dull booming reached the soldiers' ears than they perceived an even more ominous noise of war. The rasping screech of outgoing <clears throat> the raspy screeching of outgoing artillery shells passing overhead. The boys grasped, as instead of the usual faraway thought of impact, 
Some of the rounds exploded with a crash, just in front of their position. Okay, I really like the way you didn't really punch anything anymore that time, and I think it was a much better read. Remember, because if you're punching everything like you did that first time, to listen to that for 12 hours, 10 hours, 6 hours, whatever, sure. would be really, really hard. Uh, it would give the listener an intensity that would be stressful that they had to stay in for hours, you know. Um, I, I liked the feeling of that so much better. Um, remember that, the to remember your inflection too, I mean if you're telling me a story and you're really telling me trying to gain some land that no sane person would desire, I mean sane is really important there, and then you're contrasting it with, then again, insanity was the rule here, you know what I mean? So you're kind of contrasting sane and insanity, and I didn't hear any emphasis on sane like it mattered. So okay. that's just one yeah. thing to keep in mind. I think you did a good job, um, and none of us is going to be perfect. <laughs> and obviously you're working in audiobooks, so <laughs> um, I think that you're doing well. And um, I want to thank you for reading for us. Do you have any questions? No, I appreciate your input. No problem. Okay, so the next reader we've got coming up then is going to be um, Bob Bowersox and um, reading Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Yes. This is a very <clears throat> fascinating book. Um, do you know what this book is about? Because the, the extra really <clears throat> doesn't tell you. No, I, uh, I, I've heard of it, but I have not read it. <laughs> it is about a bunch of mental, I don't know, maybe enigmas, you could call it. It's, uh, it's fascinating. It's a bunch of short stories of what a neurologist has found <clears throat> uh, that have happened to different people. So um, this, this particular <clears throat> guy had lost the ability somehow to recognize people and things because he couldn't see the whole picture. He could only see the parts of it. So he'd recognize Barbara Streisand because once he saw the nose, he'd know that was who it was. He would recognize Einstein. Because once he saw the hair, he would know that was who it was. Mm -hmm. This is the first meeting that that doctor has, and he's recounting it. This is the first meeting that the doctor has with him um, when they're yeah. trying to figure out what's wrong with him. Yeah, I got that impression, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know that, that part's pretty obvious. But, um, but this was the thing that he had. And, and later on, when he mistook his wife for a hat, <clears throat> he really did. He was getting ready to go out, and he grabbed the top of her head, and he pulled it up, thinking <laughs> it was a hat. And um, she was used to that. So, okay, so you are ready. Yep, I am. It was obvious within a few seconds of meeting him that there was no trace of dementia in the ordinary sense. And yet there was something a bit odd. He faced me as he spoke, was oriented toward me, and yet there was something the matter. It was difficult to formulate. He faced me with his ears, I came to think, but not with his eyes. These, instead of taking me in, in the normal way, made strange fixations. On my nose, on my right ear, down to my chin, and up to my right eye, as if noting these individual features but not seeing my whole face, its changing expressions, me as a whole. I'm not sure that I fully realized this at the time. There was just a teasing strangeness, some failure in the normal interplay of gaze and expression. He saw me, he scanned me, and yet... What seems to be the matter? I asked him at length. Nothing that I know of, he replied with a smile. But people seem to think there's something wrong with my eyes. But you don't recognize any visual problems? No, not directly, but... Sometimes I make mistakes. Very well done. You must do a lot of audiobooks. No, I've been uh, I've been in the final uh, couple for a uh, for a few, but never made one. Well, I really think that um, that you will do very well in audiobooks because you have good pacing, good phrasing and a very good sound, and you have a unique sound. The different oh, places thanks. that you put the phrasing in is not where I would have done it, but mm. that's because you're you and I'm me, but it really came off. I think it was very good. Vanessa, do you have anything to add? I, I was just really impressed, and I was doubly impressed by uh, your separation of characters. Well, yeah. thank you. 
clearly two totally different people. Very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. This is pretty bad, Bob. Neither one of us can tell you anything bad. You know, I was really hoping to get beat up here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not the way we roll. Uh, well, anyway, Bob, I think that you will do really well if you've been um, like in the finals but not landed a book. It's just a matter of time. Well, you know, the, the I'll tell you the thing is, I appreciate your comments and all, and um, uh, I've, I've worked on it really hard. Um, done a lot of radio, and I'm an actor. Um, but uh, it's it's the protocols and how to break in. That's the that's the hard part. And we're going to get to a little bit of that as soon as we're done. Um, oh, as good. Soon as we have one other person. We're going to talk about uh, ACX and and how to get in um, okay, through good. ACX. And then also we'll have a question and answer. By the way, if you have any questions, go ahead and type the questions in now so that when we're through we'll already have some questions and you won't have to try to think some up so as the as it comes along write the questions in we won't get to them until the end but we'll have them already there in queue for us to get to okay, okay. so now we have um, let's see Sharon L Brown is the next one to read Sharon. yes hi oh hi I'm do you hear me do you hear me yeah <laughs> great okay, Sharon, are you ready I am. Whenever you're ready, go for it. It was obvious within a few seconds of meeting him that there was no trace of dementia in the ordinance. And yet there was something a bit odd. He faced me as he spoke, was oriented towards me, and yet there was something the matter. It was difficult to formulate. He faced me with his ears, I came to think, but not with his eyes. These, instead of taking me in, in the normal way, made strange fixations on my nose, on my right ear, down to my chin, and up to my right eye, as if noting these individual features, but not seeing my whole face, its changing expressions, me as a whole. I'm not sure that I fully realized this at the time. There was a teasing strangeness some failure in the normal interplay of gaze and expression. He saw me, he scanned me, and yet, what seems to be the matter? I asked him at length. Nothing that I know of, he replied with a smile. But people seem to think there's something wrong with my eye. But you don't recognize any visual problem? No, not directly, but sometimes I make mistakes. Okay, one of the things that I want you to work on, um, Sharon, is inflection. Okay. Because I think that in some ways you have been um, a little bit sing songy. You have good notes to work with, but you've been a little bit sing songy because the inflection isn't in the right place. Uh, for example, sometimes I make mistakes. How about, no, not directly, but sometimes I make mistakes. Uh, be careful not to punch the wrong words. Um, uh, work. I would work a little bit on um, the, the sing song thing and inflection, and um, uh, not to just promote myself, but I think my proof and voiceover technique CD would help you, and you can get that on at voice-overs.com, and then uh, I always offer 100% um, uh, return if you don't like it, give your 100% of your money back, but go to voice-overs.com. Proven voiceover techniques will help you with some of those basic techniques, which will help you with any kind of voiceovers, including audiobooks. Don't be a slave to punctuation. It seemed at the beginning like you were a slave to the punctuation. And again, like I mentioned to somebody else earlier, the punctuation is written like you would write, not necessarily as you would say it. Okay? And then just the last thing I would say. If you were to take care of these two basics, that would be huge. If you were to get get the notes in your song and the punctuation thing set up, you know, the inflection would uh, would handle the notes in your song would would fall into place because that's a gift that you have once you get your inflection right. In other words, you're telling the story as if you're really telling the story because that's what isn't happening here, and um, and that would take care of the inflection, the notes, and also the um, the slavery to um, to the punctuation. But another thing that I want you to think about is that I would like to hear you recount. I want to hear you 
reflect on the discovery of the story. Okay? So you're ref he, is, he was thinking back. He's reflecting on this discovery. Like the guy's looking at him and this and that and the other thing is happening. You see what I mean? Yes, I, I, I'm, I am being muted and unmuted. <laughs> what I'd like you to do, Sharon, is go ahead and redo that first paragraph up to um, me as a whole. It was obvious within a few seconds of meeting him that there was no trace of dementia in the ordinary sense. And yet there was something a bit odd. He faced me as he spoke, was oriented toward me, and yet there was something the matter. It was difficult to formulate. He faced me with his ears, I came to think, but not with his eyes. These, instead of taking me in, in the normal way, made strange fixations on my nose, on my right ear, down to my chin, and up to my right eye, as if noting these individual features, but not seeing my whole face, its changing expression, me as a whole. Okay. Um, Sharon, I, I think you have a nice voice that we'll be able to listen to for a long period of time, but I think before that happens, some of these things, uh, you need to, the things that I talked about before, you really need to work on. Um, for example, um, something a bit odd is kind of the way you might say, now I don't, I don't see where that is because half of my screen is, uh, my dashboard is covering part of my screen. But, you know, when you're saying um, something a bit odd, make it sound like that. Something a bit odd. Make it sound odd instead of saying something a bit odd. You know what I mean? Yes. How, do you have any questions uh, for us, Sharon? No, I, I took down all the notes and all the critique, and I appreciate it very much. Oh, no problem. I'm so glad you got to read for us because we're glad that we got to critique you. Okay, now I'm sure that, um, that a lot of you are wondering what to do about how to get work. And there are many ways that you can get work. I mean, you can contact publishers. Um, you, if you know an author, you can talk to the author. You can talk to the literary agents and audiobook producers. But one of the ways that anybody can get in and try and audition for audiobooks, um, and through ACX, I have, I have uh, worked for literary agents, for the authors directly, for publishing houses. You know, it, you can be working for anybody along in the process when you go through ACX. But go to acx.com, Audiobook Creation Exchange is what it stands for, and you can sign up with an account. Now, uh, Vanessa, would you explain briefly how ACX works? Oh, of course. It, it's basically a clearinghouse. Um, It'll be they're listed and there's a the tons of books are listed. There are actually hundreds of books, and then it's all broken down according to either uh, stipend, which is something that Audible actually pays per finished hour. It's I believe it's running a hundred dollars right now per finished hour. Hundred dollars, yeah. Hundred dollars per finished hour, or you can do straight royalty. If you do a stipend, uh, you also get the royalty share, which is quite nice. Little surprise checks are lovely things to have. I, I did five um, stipend royalty share books, but then there's also some of the big hitters are on there. I got a book for Audible Directly on there. I got a book for Harper Audio where they let me take my first producing credit on there. It's pretty wonderful. You go through and you see, you see what you're willing to work for, what your rate is, and then you see what there is, and then there'll be an audition script for you to audition. It's usually about four to five minutes in length. And you simply record that. You load it up. If they like it, they hire you, and you go from there. You have it's a very simple so. process. And um, ACX basically walks you through the whole thing, from going through the email to accepting the job. to, And they track it all for you. And all communications go through them, which is actually very simple as well. And then you upload the, the audio to them when you're through. And um, so you can find anything from paid jobs to uh, royalty share jobs to jobs where you get a stipend and a royalty share. That's not the case with all royalty share. That's the case with the ones that they want to get into, that audible.com wants to get into audio quicker, like bestsellers and that type of thing. So last I counted, and I didn't actually count it, but last I heard, and that varies by the day, there were about 1,800 books that are currently casting on ACX. And wow. you can go on and you can, um, you can choose the genre, you can choose um, 
who the audience would be for that. You can choose, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you can search for a particular author or a particular title to see if that's on there, if there's a book that you're hoping might be on there that you would like to voice. Um, and you can contact the, the uh, rights holder is what they call it. The person that's hiring you, they would consider the rights holder, whether that be the publisher, literary agent, or author, or, or whoever. And you can contact them. I just got a six book series because I saw some books that looked like they would be intriguing. And I opened it up and I started reading. Uh, I think they had the whole first chapter in there. And then they had a description and it was a series. And it looked really good. And I went to the second one and I looked at that and it looked really good. And so I wrote to the author and I said, hey, I'd really love to do this. And they said they were looking for a Middle Eastern accent. And I thought, good luck with that. Um, of course, they didn't get a Middle Eastern accent. So then she came back and said, I'd like you to do it. She said, there's, there's a few others that have auditioned, but I think I'd really like you to do it. So um, I've read the books now. I got them on Kindle and read them on my iPad. And they're fascinating books. I'm really looking forward to doing them. And I will start those when my, uh, when my voice comes back because it's you know, bad enough now, but you should hear it when I get on mic and try to record. It's just, um, well, it's not ready yet. <laughs> but anyway, ACX is a very, very good, um, a good clearinghouse because when you earn, say, royalty shares, so does the author or whoever. But ACX, audible.com, sends you your portion, then their portion. You don't have to worry about anybody doing the right bookkeeping. It's audible.com that sends you a check every month, depending on how many sales were made on the book. And so um, that can it's been quite good to me doing it that way. Although I, I'll only do the ones that have the stipends myself um, because I pay my editors and my entire quality control team in advance. So I want to at least have the stipend coming in to cover those costs. Anything you want to add about ACX, um, Vanessa? Yes, actually, there's one thing I would like to add. For those of you out there that are union, for those of you that are SAG-AFTRA, if you bid your work at 225, after, uh, Audible will uh, run that through the union and will pay your H&R on top of it, just so you know. At 225, not on a royalty share. No, no. It just if it's uh, if they're paying. Uh, 225, 225 per finished hour is the minimum to take at union. And ACX does it all for you, and and then Audible kicks in the twelve percent for the H and R on top of it. Okay, cool. So they're paying it all of the fees, which goes for your insurance and everything else. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a pretty it's a pretty nice thing, and so you can get your health insurance. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Very yeah. good for someone who just broke her wrist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which is Vanessa, by the way, six weeks ago. Yeah, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> Do you yeah, have any questions? Great. Oh yeah, I do too. I, I think that they're I think they're transforming the industry and that they're making it easier. Uh, the audiobook industry has always been probably easier than the voiceover industry to enter as far as people being more it's the publishing industry and people are more open to hearing from you. But ACX has basically opened it up where anybody can go on and audition for any project uh, that's on there. And I think that opens it up for you to say, I want to get my first book. Um, and it also, if you don't get hired, it gives you a chance to practice auditioning. Because sometimes you get real nervous because you're auditioning. But once you've auditioned 10 times, maybe you didn't get the job, but you've gotten practice auditioning, all of a sudden you're not quite as nervous. You know how the procedure goes. And then I think that you can do a better job on your audition. It's also easier for the big hitters to, to, trust, to trust you with a, with, a, with a first book if you've done, if you've done some, some books on ACX. Yes. And, and, and if you've done enough books and, and done them well enough to become an Audible approved producer, which is the lovely little um, stamp of approval that Audible gives to its, some of the ACX narrators, then when you go to Harper or Blackstone or Random House, they know that you can carry a book. They don't have to guess whether or not they're going to hire you, and then you're going to have troubles starting in Chapter 2. Right. Not being able to carry, you know, a nine-hour book. You know, we recently had an article in the Free Voiceover Insider um, about step-by-step -step how to break in with ACX. And um, Gary is going to go ahead and email that to every single person who is attending this webinar, um, including you at home if you uh, are, are not listening 
but you bought it to get the audio after the fact, you should have received the email with that article as well. So that will have more information about ACX, but that's probably the easiest way to break into um, audiobooks. And if you've heard about it and you're wondering like how legit it is or whatever, and you're thinking, well, I've been on there and I haven't landed anything. Well, that may be because there are a lot of professionals on there. I've gotten books on ACX. Vanessa's gotten books on ACX. Um, there's a lot of pros that that do audiobooks on a regular basis that are landing work there. So ACX doesn't mean you're competing with, um, you know, all the newbies. You're competing in the black belt arena. But jump in, because it doesn't hurt. Jump in and do what you can. It's free to set it up, um, and you just might find yourself landing a book that fits you and doesn't fit other people. And, um, and that's the one that's going to turn out the best. Now, let me see if I can, um, Gary, I'm going to pull this out of here and see if we have any questions. Wow, we sure do. Are most audiobook narration projects done in the talent's home studios, or is the talent required to go to the production studio to record? Karen wants to know. You want to start with that one, Vanessa? I do about 90% of my work in my home studio. If I'm doing, um, obviously for Random House, I have to go to Woodland Hills and, and, and work there. And if I'm doing, uh, you know, if I have a series. And I, so I'm only doing a book a year, and I, and, so I, and I have 35 references from last year. I almost always take that to an outside studio as well, simply because it's just too much, it's too much to do to, to deal with the engineering part of listening to the references from a year ago and actually working on, on the book in the moment. But mostly, everything is out of my home studio, which I've, I've really kind of grown to like because most of the, um, well, all of the major publishers supply you with um, a proofer and an editor. So all I do is I do a punch and roll and I uh, post on my FTP and then I get, I get back the corrections and all I do is, is do the corrections and send those on in a single track. It just makes life a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I think um, as far as audiobooks go, 100% of all, of all of the books I've done have been through my home. I'm not living in a very good area um, for where audiobooks are being produced, you know, like where I could just drive down the street and go produce an audiobook. Um, but I have no trouble getting, it seems to be accepted within the industry that people work from home. So I have no trouble getting work to do from home. I just do it myself. And I have worked with, um, mostly I get my own editors and mostly I have my own quality control. First of all, um, I, I have someone, no matter what, who's going to sit behind me as I'm reading because sometimes I'll say the wrong word or I'll skip a word. You know, it's like I say, you say consumer instead of customer. You know, sometimes things come out or, or you skip a major word in there and you keep going and it, it still makes sense and, um, and you don't catch that. But the person who's following the script behind you can catch it and then you can correct it right then and there and make it much easier for the editor. So um, I mostly work at home. And, um, and I really like it that way. I mean, if I feel like I had a really rough weekend, my son had food poisoning. And um, so I, I had a, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep this weekend, starting from 1.30 in the morning, Saturday morning until probably, um, you know, Sunday night. And I've been sleeping 10 to 12 hours since. So I can do that. I can say, oh, up at nine or 10 o'clock, okay? But then I can go in and I can record because I'm on my own schedule. And that's what I really like about working at home and by myself. We have deadlines, but um, and I try to work far ahead because you never can foresee what might come up that can delay you. But I don't have to go in and work with people. Plus, I found and and I know that I could get past this, but for me, it's easier to stay in the moment if I'm on my own rather than in there um, with somebody directing. But then again, when you're in the moment and you're on a roll, they don't stop you to direct you either. And I don't find it distracting when I've got one of my quality control readers sitting behind me with a script. So, you know, it might be fine going out and doing it too. I've certainly have done a zillion other voiceovers with, you know, in somebody else's studio. Okay. Um, Vanessa, any hints on character differentiation, especially female and male, vo uh, female voices, male narrator? I always feel like my second or third female voice is too similar and fades in and out of character. 
Yeah, uh, basically what what I talked about earlier, which is pick a reference. If you if uh, you like to watch, uh, I don't know, CSI, you know, if you and you pick two women that are on that show, you will not find yourself wandering. If you if you have picked yourself a solid reference that means something in your head. It, it, it simply won't happen. It's it's difficult in the beginning, and when you're first starting out, something that helps is to edit edit yourself. If you uh, if you do your own editing when you're first starting out, and that's the first thing that you do in the morning is you edit yesterday's work. Those characters are going to be crystal clear in your head when you go into the booth to finish. Once you've done once you've got once you've done six, seven, eight books, you won't need that crutch anymore. You won't need to edit your stuff anymore either. Uh, because it'll become second nature to you. But men have the hardest time because they tend to think that women um, have voices that are higher than theirs. And frankly, my voice is lower than most men. And if you'll watch television, just watch television and close your eyes, you will hear that many women's voices are lower than, than the men in the same show. So what you want to do is pick one that is lower than your man and then pick a woman that's higher. There'll be no way for you to confuse the two. Okay, another um, question. This is Lisa wants to know if the representative of ACX that we mentioned in the information about this webinar is still going to be joining us this evening to talk about how to begin voicing audiobooks. No, Charles was not able to make it. it was, it's Charles Clerk. He was unable to make it tonight. But um, if you want to begin voicing audiobooks, assuming that you have the studio that you need and you have the ability, go to ACX set up an account and then start auditioning. That's how you can get started. And then once you have a few books under your belt, then when you approach another um, an, another audiobook producer, they're going to be like, oh, well, she, he, she's experienced. She's done a few books. Really, a few books is enough to tell them that you've got some experience. Yeah, they like people who've done 100 books, but a few books does say, yes, she can do the book, and especially if you've become an audio finalist or um, uh, an earphone award winner or finalist, um, like Vanessa won the earphone award, what, last year? Uh, this year? Two months ago. Two months ago. Two yeah. months ago. Okay. So, you know, that's, that's something that helps open the doors. Um, people started calling me when on my first book I got the, um, the Audi finalist, you know, in, in one category on my very first book. And Vanessa, it was like after your very first book, wasn't it, that you got your first audio finalist, wasn't it? It, it was. It was my very first book. <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? For both yeah. of us, yeah. it was the very first book. And, and I, um, only, when you... I only got that because someone, someone got sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay. I got mine because my friend wrote it. There you go. So you Whatever just get works. into it any way you can. Exactly. By hook or by crook. <laughs> That's right. Now I got to tell you, all the other books I've done haven't been because my friend wrote it. <laughs> That's right. But That's you get in any way you can. First one. Yeah, yeah. Just got to get that but first one. Even that first one is going to be easier because when Vanessa and I started, which she started probably a year before I did, um, when she and I started doing audiobooks, I believe um, ACX wasn't around. No. I mean. We had to go out and pedal the pavement. I mean, yeah, I got the first one. Once I got the nominee, people started calling me. Audible started calling me. Other producers started calling me because then it became out there. I mean, for everybody in the industry to see, these four are this, these four are this. You know, so uh, then you start getting attention. But it's easier now because you don't have to know the author or be called because the person who was supposed to do it got sick. You can just go on in and audition for umpteen books. Give yourself time and just feel your way through it and audition for the books and you'll be surprised um, how quickly you land one. But just don't give up. Exactly. And then if you don't get one, it doesn't mean that you're bad. It can mean that someone else is more suitable for that particular project. Okay, how is talent paid for audiobook narration? Is it a flat fee for project? Does it have to be, um, does one have to be in the union to receive royalty fees? You want to feel that one? Um, well, hmm. royalties are not uh, paid uh, through the union. There are no royalties um, for audiobook work in the union at this point, with the exception of an odd little contract that Recorded Books in New York has. But 100% um, of all the audiobook work that I do is union. 
So I get a minimum of $225 per finished hour. It's usually closer to 300 depending on what I have to do. If I'm if I'm fully producing, it's it's closer to three. If I'm only narrating, it's closer to two to two twenty five. But there are even some <coughs> Blackstone, for instance, has we just signed a contract with them, and it's it, we actually got are getting less pay than we used to get because they wanted to split the H and R with us. So if you go and work for Blackstone, you're going to make one hundred and ninety dollars an hour, which is fine because you're getting twelve percent on top of that for your health and retirement. So that's how I'm paid. But th this is relatively new. Uh, three years ago, there were no audiobook uh, union jobs. There were none. And now, and now most of the houses are organized. Tantor, Random House, Blackstone, Harper. Uh, we have not organized Brilliance yet. Um, but most of the other houses are organized. And some of them, like Random House, have an opt-in. And you have to opt-in, and, and then that's it. It's like the first book for Random House, they'll say, do you want to take it? Do you want to do union or non-union? And if you're non-union, just so everybody knows, that you can take a union book, and that book will turn you union if you so choose. Otherwise, you can take it non-union. But once you elect to take it non-union, every single thing that you do for Random House from that point forward will be non-union. That's my two cents. Okay, now... Um, there's typically not a flat fee for a project. Occasionally you might find that. Um, I found that mostly on children's books. But um, as far as being in the union, Vanessa is in the union. I am not in the union. I receive royalty fees when I get a book on ACX. But when I'm hired, it's typically uh, a per finished hour. And it's, again, like Vanessa, it's up towards the, um, the, the $300 an hour. But I provide the editing and the quality control. Um, when it's on ACX, it's a hundred dollar stipend per finished hour, and then I get checks from the mailman every month of all the books that have sold, and that's actually worked out pretty well for me. Um, someone told me that that would wane, because I think the first the first month I got something like I don't know six hundred on one book, and I thought, wow, you know, this could be pretty good. And then um, they said, oh yeah, well that's just the first month. But then again, more books and more books and more books, and then it doesn't really get lower because you've got your you know you're getting commission on. Uh, royalties on payments for a lot of books, um, and no, you don't. <clears throat> union doesn't do um, royalty fees. I hear the weird noise too. Okay, let's move on. Assuming you're a talented narrator, how do you market yourself to stand out among other talent vying for the same projects? You want to start, Vanessa? Well, it's it's really not an issue. The only place where you are even allowed to co compete directly is ACX, and who knows what the heck's going on over there. You don't. You you have no idea who you're competing against. The way it works more and more is that, for instance, at Random House, um, Dan Zid in New York will choose York who is doing um, the project, and then he will take that to the author. And this is relatively a new occurrence. He will take that to the author for author approval, and then you're in. There isn't there isn't an audition process where you're competing against someone else. The best and it's. It's irrelevant anyway. One of my favorite sayings is, don't compete, excel. You don't need to worry about what everybody else is doing. You just need to do excellent work because you're different than anybody else on the planet. So there are books that are looking for just your sound and just your take. See, I agree 100% with that. You know, it's not, about, it's not about who's better. Vanessa and I could be put up against the same book, and who would they hire? I, I don't know. The one they would hire would be the one that's right for the job. The one that has, again, the voice that the author heard in their head or the producer heard in their head when they said it or that gave just the right. Um, Hillary Huber got a, a series of books because when she uh, did her audition for those books, the author said, yes, and it was different. Hillary was different in that. That's the attitude I felt when I wrote it, and that's why she got it. She ended up getting, I think, about six books through that one. So don't worry about who you're competing against. Just feel what you're saying and be yourself as you bring yourself to the story and tell the story. And then if that's what they're looking for, you'll be the one to get it. Vanessa, several months ago you posted on Facebook that you are producing titles for Audible. What is your process for casting and should people send demos to you? Um, yes, I do produce for Audible. It's quite an interesting process. Um, 
I cast generally people that I have that I know that I know their work. Um, I also uh, cast my former students because I because I know their work. But I do not cast anyone who hasn't done a book before. I did that the first round of books, the first 25 books that Audible gave me. I cast um, some people who had not done it before, and I, I'm, I'm just not going to do it again because it was too difficult and ended up uh, costing me a lot of money in post. Yes. So if you've done a couple of books and you, and, you, and, you, and you know what's going on, absolutely send me your demo. Um, but Greg has a question. Um, if, if he only wants to do nonfiction, should he have a fiction read on his demo anyway? And what's the ba best way to pursue nonfiction work? My feeling is um, if you want to do nonfiction, send them nonfiction. However, there will be some places you want to find out that this is interesting. You know, it's, it's not a one size fits all demo. They want demos that fit what that particular producer does. If that producer doesn't do children's, don't have a children's demo on there. But the producers will want to know what you like to do. And if they do fiction and nonfiction, send it to them. And some will want to hear both, but tell them that you specialize in nonfiction. And then that's what they'll think of you for. That's the category that they'll put you in. And they might have a fiction work that seems to fit you. I mean, I specialize in nonfiction if you want to say that, but I've actually done just as much, much fiction as I have nonfiction. Um, I find fiction a lot easier, and sometimes I get lazy, so I like to stick with, I mean, nonfiction. So I like to stick with nonfiction. But then there came this book, the series, that I loved when I saw it on ACX. And I got that, and I'm about to do six not six fiction books. So Vanessa, I'll probably call you crying. <laughs> Help! No, I'm just kidding. I always tell her characters. That's not my strength. You know, we all have our strengths, and characters are not mine. Characters are hers. So uh, I may call and get a little bit of coaching, as she's done coaching with me for medical. So we just all work That's together. Right. That's but we um, uh, pursuing nonfiction work, I would say, um, is the same as pursuing fiction work. Wouldn't you think, Vanessa? Well, yes. I just think you have to be really careful. You have to really know because if, if, if you want to do nonfiction, then that's what you want to do. If you want to do fiction, do not put nonfiction on your demo. Don't do it because once you, once you get into a bit with all the bigger houses, they pigeonhole you. And it's not a nice thing, but it's the way it is. I know a Broadway actor who's a very good friend of mine who moved to Los Angeles, and the first book that he did for Random House was a nonfiction book. And even though he was a Broadway actor. They have never, to this day, let him do a fiction book. Wow. Yeah, and 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 he's one of the best actors I, I I've had the privilege to know. So just so you know, w once you get in with the bigger houses, whatever. For instance, Random House only gives me literature. Blackstone only gives me fun comedy, um, detective kind of stuff. That's who I am to those to those people. And that's just the way it is. They wouldn't give me a comedy at Random House if the earth opened up in front of me. <laughs> it's just, you're, right. just, you're going to get pigeonholed. So JC be, and Mary both have a very similar question. Um, how does one get nominated or win the Audi Award or Earphone Award? Somebody likes you. <laughs> Someone you do who good you, work. <laughs> yeah, you do good work, and then somebody... Um, like in Vanessa's case, um, uh, Stefan Rudnicki? Was well, it? It, would, it, it, it was actually, I believe that was an audible thing, so it would have been Charzik. Okay. Stefan Rudnicki, well, Stefan Rudnicki was, you know, the producer, but he was the secondary producer. He, he didn't I see. the book. Yeah. So okay. He's the producer. Someone you've worked for decides to submit you for it. It costs money. They submit you for the award, and then um, a panel chooses who the finalists are of all the people. And it is an honor to be a finalist for Audi. Um, and that that's done by the um, Audio Publishing Association, um, who's having their conference coming up um, Memorial Weekend, by the way, in New York City. If you're there, you might want to think about that. And then, Vanessa, what about an earphone award? Well, that's through Audiophile. And you just uh -huh. wake Audio up file one magazine. morning. The Audio file magazine. You just wake up one morning, and you've got tons of emails <laughs> because because you want an earphone, and it's pretty cool. You don't know what's happening. It comes out of the blue, and it's it, it, and it's it's pretty incredible. And you get a lovely little certificate and a little note, and it's it's quite nice. Awesome. I just picked up my audio file that I have right here, thinking, oh, maybe you're in this one. And then I saw it's July 2007. 
That can go yeah, in the no. trash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, William wants to know, I hear you saying you don't do accents. Well, that must be me. Um, thoughts? What would you say, Vanessa? About accents? Yes. Well, I, I, I've got a pocket full of them. I, I uh -huh. do whatever they ask me to do. And if, if I don't know what I'm doing, I go to IDEA, and I listen until I know. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you, um, it's not as hard as you think it is. Um, <coughs> you'll find that once you, you, you put your foot out there, and if you're just brave, an accent is just an accent. It's not that big a deal. Um, it, it can get a little complicated when, you, when you've got five or six in a piece. Um, a piece that I had a lot of trouble with is because it kept moving from, um, from British to Italian, and that made me a little crazy. I would have to stop because I would get all confused. Um, <clears throat> and the piece that I'm doing right now is Texas, and Central Texas, and uh, New Jersey. And that makes me a little crazy. But it's, it, it, you can find uh, references everywhere. And if, you, if you're looking for references and you, if you don't know about audio eloquence, that's pages and pages that narrators have put together um, of where to find basically anything, how to pronounce anything, where to go to get references for different kinds of accents. Um, but you, like I said earlier, don't do it unless you have to. But if, right. but if it says he's Indian and the, he's, if the, he's an Indian cab driver, he's got to be an Indian cab driver. Right. Yeah. Um, is that audio eloquence you said? Yes. Audioeloquence.com? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, my thought on accents is this. I will tell you that I don't do accents, but in one of the last books that I did, which was a nonfiction, um, <laughs> one of those books that we, we uh, fondly say nobody, including the author's mother, will actually read, but at least we got paid for it, <laughs> I had to do German accent, oh, Jewish accent, um, and, and speak Jewish words too and speak German words too. I had to do Italian, I had to do French. I, I can't even remember a British, I can't even remember what I had to do. And it was and one of those. And you did it. I did it. And you know what? Here's the funny thing is probably they never heard it to hear how bad it was because nobody would ever listen past the first chapter. <laughs> the content was so boring that I, I swear I am not kidding you, my editor literally fell asleep editing that book. His wife came in and hollered to him, hey, you know, and he woke up <laughs> as it was rolling. Oh my God. Oh my he literally, I couldn't fall asleep while I was voicing it, but believe me, I was tempted to. It was, yeah. it was just one of the most boring things ever. And sometimes that happens, you know, but yes, you're right. I did the accents. I say I don't do accents. And now I'm really discovering that they kind of do. Yeah. You know, if you, if you study with Pat Fraley, study accents with Pat Fraley, you'll see that he says, you really don't have to do them perfectly. And what I say is that when you're doing um, a character in an audiobook, the main thing they want is to differentiate who's talking. You're not going to fool them into thinking it's somebody else's voice and not yours. You're the one who's telling the story. I mean, they know it's Vanessa telling the story. They know it's Julie telling the story. They know it's Mary or JC or Greg telling the actual story. But this way, they know when the cab driver is speaking and they know when the person in the cab is speaking based on, you know, if they don't have he says and she says. So I think that's, that's part of the purpose. Plus, you're also adding color to the character by um, defining them through just the way they speak. But it's not going to fool anybody. They're all going to know it's you doing the accent. So if the accent's a little bit off, I think they're going to forgive you. They won't even know. That's true too, huh? <laughs> she has more confidence than I do. <laughs> she says they won't even know. I say they wouldn't get to that chapter anyway because the book was so boring. Oh, um, somebody mentioned they're hearing more and more audiobooks with can sound effects. Is that a new trend? So I haven't seen that. I haven't seen. Yeah. It. I haven't. Done well, it's it's mostly with with multi. Uh, you'll find it a lot with the the big big um, simultaneous releases from the major houses. Um, and then there's, and then we're getting a lot more audio theater than we used to get. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the dramatic audio. Yes, I lost to one of those, the Audi. That's okay. Richard Dreyfus, Jim Caviezel. I guess I can lose to them, right? It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I there's sleep no at night. Long. <laughs> okay. I, I think we've got pretty much everything that somebody has asked done. Vanessa, you have been Great. so awesome. You Thank always you. are. 
It was a pleasure. Have. You're awesome yourself. Well, thank you. And, uh, and Gary, we want to thank you for handling everything. I know you've answered probably everybody in here uh, an email from them about how to get on and, <laughs> and other tech questions. Be watching for another email that may come out tomorrow because we have got the most incredible, um, I'm not going to say any names until we have you know the ink dry on the contract, okay? But we have got a webinar coming up in two weeks that is going to be, it's just going to knock your socks off. And I'm really, really excited about it. So um, be sure to pay attention when the emails come out that tell you what's coming up, okay? Thank you so much for joining us. And I uh, want to encourage you to, um, to be part of the VoiceOver Insider. And also to mention that if you need to get a hold of me, you can email me at julie at voice-overs.com. And you can email Vanessa at vanessa at vanessahart.info. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>